somebody submitted. Uh, this question said, can you please explain Genesis 126, which states, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The question is, who is us and our referring to? Yeah, Genesis 126 can be a, a little bit tricky, right? Because it doesn't seem to fit neatly into uh, the way that we think about how it should have been written. You know, So let's go to Genesis 126 if we can. It's already up there. You guys are on it. Genesis 126 says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over every uh, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And uh, immediately after that, of course, we find that, and so God uh, created man in his own image, not their image. So this this is a scripture that can be a little bit confounding. It doesn't really matter what you believe about the nature of God or the person of uh, Jesus Christ is um, what's what exactly is going on here? Who is God talking to? The truth of the matter is with Genesis 126, there are... Um, there are different answers that are out there that are debated. And so I can only, uh, I can cover all of them, I guess, but I can just tell you where I stand on some of these. And in order to do that, so Genesis 126 is kind of a favorite uh, in uh, uh, Trinitarian schools teaching whatever, uh, because it, it seems like the strongest case in the Old Testament for uh, the plurality of God. It's kind of ironic because you can find over, you know, 90 verses, you know, they call them the Holy One of Israel. There is one God. God is one. There are no other gods. I'm all alone. And then you get one verse that can be a little bit confounding if you, depending on how you read it. And they'll, you know, ignore the 99. They'll do, you know, like Jesus, they'll leave the 99 and go to the one. <laughs> and uh, we don't want to do that with the Bible. That's not a good, it's good for souls, not good for scripture. So, uh, we're going to talk about this. The reason why this scripture is so um, uh, leaned on when trying to explain the doctrine of the Trinity is because, well, two, twofold. Number one is the, the use of us and our, which I'll get to in just a moment. But also, uh, the principle that in the Old Testament, um, the word for God, Elohim, is a plural word, or at least that's the way that it's thrown out there very quickly, and then people move on. So here's the question. And we're reading Genesis 126. Is this one unidentified person of the Trinity speaking to two other co equal un- unidentified persons of the Trinity? Um, if this were the only Bible verse that had anything to say about the nature of God or the creation, then I suppose we could be compelled to believe that what is being described here is more than one person of God. But of course, we know we don't read the Bible in a vacuum, do we? We don't read one verse in isolation because, well, you know, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. Think about Matthew 28, 19 is another perfect example of this is that, well, if Matthew 28, 19 were the only verse about water baptism, then yeah, I could see how somebody could lean on the idea that let's baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. But then we see in all these instances in the book of Acts where they baptize in Jesus' name, and it's the same people who were told to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. So were they disobedient or did they misunderstand? No, of course not. It's just the Bible has context. Context. And so uh, this is no different than that. Um, of course, this is not the only scripture about the creation. So let's read some others. I just read to you Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Uh, Isaiah 44 and 24 is another popular passage that we can uh, go to. It says, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things. Everybody say all. All All things. Bishop Bingham would have said all means all. That stretches forth the heavens alone, spreads the earth abroad by myself. You can't get more explicit than that. Uh, Whoever is speaking here is excluding the possibility of anybody else helping him. So whether you think it's God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Ghost, it doesn't really matter. The other two are getting excluded from this statement. I did it all by myself. I did it alone. We see this again. Isaiah 44 and 8 says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it. You uh, are even my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So... 
if we have scriptures that tell us God was alone in creation and did it by himself, then what do we do with Genesis 126? The first thing I want to deal with is this word Elohim. This, this argument kind of frustrates me a little bit because the people that we inherited the Old Testament scriptures from have never read this verse and been so confounded by it that they thought there was more than one person of God. Um, for generations, the Jews were man- they managed to preserve the Old Testament uh, with such integrity, and it doesn't matter if you're reading a KJV or, or a JPS or whatever. Um, this scripture reads how it reads, and so uh, at least with Elohim being a plural word. And so the question is, if Elohim is a plural word, then why weren't they convinced? Well, here's the reason why. Elohim is not, quote unquote, a plural word. It can be a plural word. And this is where we've got to, I don't want to bore anybody. My pastor would say, I don't want to make you snore in Greek and dream in Hebrew. But we do have to break down some language stuff in order to help you understand this. So Genesis 126, the word God, Elohim, on the surface, yes, Elohim is a plural noun. But you have to understand something about, first of all, the Hebrew language is not like English. In English, singularity and plurality of the nouns are controlled by the subject, not the predicate. In verb, it's, in Hebrew, it's exactly the inverse. So the predicate controls the singularity and plurality of the noun. And so uh, the question is, is, in this verse, is the verb singular or plural? It turns out that it's singular, which in this case makes Elohim, the use of Elohim, singular. Now, that, that does matter uh, for a couple of reasons. Because Elohim is not a name of God. Elohim does not refer to any specific God. The gradual revelation of the name of God in the Old Testament is a doctrine. It is, not, uh, it, it, it is a feature, not a bug. So why don't we see the Tetragrammaton? Why don't we see the, the yod Hey vav Hey? Why don't we see Yahweh in Genesis 1 and 1? We don't, see gen- we don't see that yet. All we see is this very general reference, Elohim. Well, what does Elohim mean? Well, here it's used as the word God. In Genesis chapter number 23, if you want to throw the slide that I sent you, the Genesis 23, 5 through 6, just so you guys don't think I'm yanking your chain. Genesis chapter number 23, verses 5 and 6, this uh, scripture, uh, can you throw, uh, before we read, can you throw just the scripture up there first? I apologize. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, who? Abraham, okay, this is who we're speaking about. And saying unto him, verse number six, hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. Speaking to Abraham, the children of Heth say, you are a mighty prince among us. Well, if you want to throw that other slide back up there, this is the translation of mighty prince, Elohim. It is the exact same word, the exact same spelling that we just read for God in Genesis 126. Only this time, it's referring to Abraham. Now, here's my question. If you are in the camp of people that say, well, because Elohim is a plural word, that must mean that God is a trinity. Here's my question. Is Abraham also a trinity? Because Abraham was called Elohim too. So you can't get out of it that quickly, all right? Abusing the Hebrew language to try and fit theology is, to me, it's abrasive at the least and maybe offensive at the worst. To, you, you, to, to not have a mastery of a language and then to, to, to use one point of that language to prove your point is, is not, not, good, not good academic discipline. So moving on, we know that Elohim is at least once, refers to Abraham. Exodus chapter number 12 and verse two, uh, 12 and 12, excuse me. Exodus 12 and 12 tells us, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, gods of Egypt, G-O-D-S, also Elohim. So here's my question. Are the idols of this present world, are they also a part of the Holy Trinity? No. Elohim is not a word that is specifically used for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It can be, but it is not always used in that context. I also want to point out that just like it was used in the singular to describe Abraham, Elohim, It's here used in the plural to describe the idols of Egypt, okay? So how do we know which one to use when, okay? Throughout, and I'm not going to read them all on the screen, but Exodus 21 and 6 tells us 
that Elohim are the judges of Israel. Ruth 1 and 15 says that the Elohim are the gods of the Moabites. Psalm 8 and 5 says the Elohim are the angels. The angels are called Elohim. So, so this is a little bit confounding, right? If it can be used to refer to false gods and judges and magistrates and Prince Abraham and the angels or the God of all creation, then how do we know what the correct interpretation of Elohim is in a given passage? And here's the principle. Context matters, okay? You have to read the Bible in context. So we're going to do a little intellectual exercise together because we're going to learn a little bit about Hebrew. We're going to learn a little bit about how you're supposed to read certain parts of the Bible, and uh, I think it'll be fun. Uh, if you want to throw the first, uh, first word up there that had the, yeah, there we go. Okay, that's, that hyphen, let's imagine that that's a letter, that, that's just a, a missing letter in the middle, okay? What is that word? Which one? We're going to be here all night. (laughs) Cat, cot, cut. I don't know. Throw the next one up there. What's this word? Sun, S-U-N, sun, S-O-N, sin, S-I-N. It's difficult, isn't it? Go to the next one. This is a good one. What is it? Pester. Could be pastor. Not that those two things go together. Pester, pastor. What about poster? Could be poster, yeah. How are you supposed to know what is what? Okay, we're gonna learn, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you a little bit about Hebrew, and then we're going to move on to another question. So Hebrew, and this is true of all Near Eastern languages. It's not just Hebrew. Arabic, uh, even, some of the, uh, even some languages in the uh, you know, Eastern Asian countries, uh, early, early writings are written, number one, right to left, but also without vowels, okay? It is a language of consonants. There are no vowels. And so here's my question. In those three words, would having the vowel have helped? In every single one of them, it would have helped, right? Languages, early Near Eastern languages were written with consonants, and sentences were not read with the, with the idea that standalone words had their own definition, You needed the entire context of a sentence to know what any of the words meant, okay? Every language that was written right to left, every language that was written with just consonants was written this way. The reason why nouns became so popular and found their way primarily into Western written languages, which would be like Latin, Greek, English, that moved from left to right, not right to left, is that nouns gave language a new dimension. Words could adopt standalone meanings in addition addition to contextual ones, okay? So we know that uh, when we look at that word C dash T, if you add the vowel, it now has a standalone meaning all by itself. You don't need the context of the sentence, okay? Both the development of vowels, uh, before the development of vowels, written language required a nuanced understanding of all the characters in the sentence to be read collectively. In Western languages, they could be read individually, okay? And this is why English uh, certainly has become one of the most dominant, la- all the Latin based languages, but certainly English has become such a dominant language, okay? Eastern languages require that you read the entire sentence together to get the context of individual words. This is not just true of singularity and plurality, by the way. There's another example, and I I can't uh, throw like a slide, but I'll just, I'll give you the scripture. So Genesis number, uh, Genesis 15 and 17, Genesis 15 and 17 says, it came to pass that when the sun went down. In this scripture, sun is grammatically feminine. But if you go to Genesis 19 and 23, the exact same word with the exact same spelling is used, and this time it's grammatically masculine, okay? No no change in the word, no change in the spelling, no change in anything. All that changes is the context surrounding the sentence. And so you have to, without, I know we're not going to go deep into like Hebrew 101, 102, 104, whatever uh, tonight, but suffice it to say, in order to read it rightly, you have to know the context of the sentence. So let's go back to Genesis 126. What is the context? In Genesis 126, let us make man in our image. Make is singular, which controls Elohim in this specific example. So I'm not saying that Elohim is never plural. It can be plural. It just depends on what's happening in the predicate. In Genesis 126, the predicate is singular, making the subject also singular, okay? So there's your grammar lesson for tonight. Uh, There's a fascinating book you can read on 
uh, languages, how languages develop, moving uh, right to left and then eventually left to right. It's called The Great Partnership. Phenomenal book uh, that I really, really enjoyed. Um, one of the things that I found fascinating was that the early proto-Greek writings uh, that were adopted from the Hebrew alphabet, they actually, the manuscripts are written, the first sentence is right to left, and then the second sentence below it is left to right, and then right to left, and then left to right. That's how, that, that was the first iteration of Greek writing. It was incredibly confusing, and they eventually uh, got rid of it. But um, nouns change the world, so there you go. We, uh, or excuse, uh, 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 vowels change the world, thank you. Vowels, vowels changed how we understand nouns, okay? So that's answering the Elohim question. The us question, this is where uh, there are different theories, different interpretations of what this means. You can read some, there are ancient rabbinic commentaries that say, let us make, uh, is referring, this is God speaking with the heavenly council, with the angels. Um, I understand why people think that. Um, some of that comes down to whether or not you believe angels are made in the image of God or not. I don't personally believe angels are made in the image of God. I believe in angels. I believe they're powerful. I believe they certainly have uh, their purpose and their role in the church. I have a different view of this. So I don't believe that God is speaking to the angels. I don't believe, certainly I don't believe that the angels had any help uh, in the creation process. I tend to take this, uh, I read this in the context of uh, the 16th century translators. And so um, in the 1100s, the Latin-based languages adopted a principle that exists even today. You can, you can just Google it on your phone, uh, Google define if you ever use that. Um, what we, there's a phrase called the royal we, okay? Um, it is uh, very popular. You see it mo more than one time in the scripture. You certainly see it. I was actually listening to a golf podcast the other day and somebody used it. Um, it it's kind of a, it's a, a weird way of talking that we don't necessarily think of as common today. But the purpose of the phrase is to, de is to denote complete sovereignty or uh, more accurately, uh, total supremacy or power over a given whether it's a situation or in some cases a country or whatever it might be. Um, this does matter because if you are reading the King James Version Bible, it is not a mistranslation to say, let us make. They said what they meant and they meant what they said. The issue is not, um, did the translators have an agenda, a Trinitarian agenda? I don't believe the King James, I personally believe the King James Version Bible is, is divinely uh, given to us. I, the KJV Bible is not compiled by Catholics. It was not manipulated by the Catholic Church. King James, uh, first of England, sixth of Scotland, he wasn't even a Catholic. He was a Protestant. He was almost killed for it. And so, uh, no, I don't believe that the Bible's been manipulated. I don't believe that they were trying to teach us about a trinity. Um, you have to understand, though, that there was certain vernacular that was common to their time that was, the, in their mind at least, the perfect way to translate what they were reading in the Hebrew. So, for example, you can go to other scriptures, um, one in particular that I wrote down earlier today, Numbers chapter number 24 and verse 8. The scripture speaks of the strength of a unicorn. Um, this word unicorn actually appears in the Old Testament six times. Um, is this the one-horned horse that we know of from myth? Of course not. Unicorns don't exist, guys. I'm sorry. So were the translators lying or were they trying to mislead the reader? No, of course not. The answer is neither. This is just simply how they spoke. And, uh, of course, the, uh, in modern translations today, that word unicorn is probably going to say something like wild ox. But that was the common way of speaking about this wild ox to the King James translators. And so you go back to the question of, okay, if Elohim is a plural word and you're using the King's English, how would you translate Elohim? And they actually did it exactly how they should. Let us make uh, is a perfect way uh, for them to summarize what they saw being uh, certainly not experts in Hebrew, but having enough understanding to realize what was happening, that God is making by himself, but he's speaking with a total sovereign authority. Um, this is exactly how you would translate it. So I tend to, I certainly tend to lean this way. I think there's a lot of evidence for it, um, both in uh, biblical history and extra biblical history. Um, that being said, there are other theories out there. I don't have anything against somebody who uh, goes with the, the interpretation that angels are also made in the image of God. There's just, it's never explicitly said in the Bible that they are, and so that I tend to avoid that. Um, human beings, I believe, are uniquely made in the image of God, uh, and I believe that that's why he came to earth, was to redeem his image. And so, um, moving on. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, we can talk more about it later. Uh, that was certainly, in my opinion, that was going to be the hardest one to get through uh, tonight because there's so many moving parts. 
Uh, number two, this question was, please explain the baptism of Jesus from a oneness perspective. Um, we spent a fair bit of time the last couple of weeks on Adamic Christology, so I won't uh, overwhelm you with that. But you do have to understand the sonship of Jesus Christ through the sin of Adam. You have to. Um, this is why he is always called the Son of God and he is never called God the Son. Okay, It does matter how you talk about the humanity of Jesus Christ because if you see the phrase Son of God as something denoting a person that is divine then you are going to run into questions of, do I have one divine person speaking to another divine person? When that's not really what's happening, what's happening is you have God speaking to a man. And so uh, before we deal with the, the baptism of Jesus, every, I know the phrase from the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We'll get to that. Um, I want to deal with the Holy Ghost part of it first, though, because this is the one and only scripture that I have ever heard any Trinitarian thinker of any caliber, they go to and say, look, there is the entire Trinity in one verse. You have the Father speaking from heaven, and you have the Spirit descending like a dove, and you have the Son who's being baptized. And they say, this has to be the Trinity. Of course, that's not what's happening, but uh, we will um, we'll work through it. Ephesians chapter number four and verse number one. Ephesians four and one, very familiar reading. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, everybody say the Spirit, in the bond of peace, verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, next verse, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and, okay, this matters a lot if you're a Trinitarian and it doesn't matter almost at all if you're oneness. This scripture absolutely confounds the principles of the Trinity and it also confounds the baptism of Jesus if you're a Trinitarian, okay? The spirit descending in a bodily shape like a dove on Christ Nowhere does the scripture say that this is a, another person of God that is, that is not already God the Spirit. Nowhere does it say that the Spirit of God is something that we're supposed to understand as separate from the Father. In fact, Ephesians said that there is one body and one Spirit. Now, there are no Trinitarian thinkers today that will tell you that God the Father is not a Spirit. Yes, they believe he's a Spirit. Here's the problem. If God the Father is a Spirit and God the Holy Ghost is a Spirit, then you've got two Spirits. And Ephesians says there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. And oh, by the way, in case you were confused, the Holy Ghost that lives in you is actually the Father who is above all and through all and in you all, okay? So the spirit that descends like a dove, in no, no circumstance should it be understood as a person of God that is not the fullness of God. It's just, God is a spirit. That's what the Bible tells us. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? So uh, that, just dealing with the spiritual side, Romans, eight and, Romans chapter number 8 and verse 9, we can go to quickly as well. I know I did this one last week, but Romans chapter number 8 and verse 9, Paul is writing, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If you're a Trinitarian, this is the third person of the Trinity. Spirit of God, God the spirit, okay? Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay, next verse. It says, and if Christ be in you, now that's supposed to be God the son. So we're not even talking about the spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit. Now we're just talking about Christ in me. Christ in me is from a Trinitarian perspective, a little confounding. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness, verse number 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, then he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. So the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead also has a spirit that will raise you up. So how many spirits are in me now? Is it three? Is it four? How many spirits live inside the believer? Just one. God is a spirit. He is an omnipresent spirit. And it's not wrong to think of God in heaven on the throne, just like it's not wrong to think about God among us and through us and in us. Okay, that's what omnipresence means. 
So from the scriptures, we know that the spirit that descends in a bodily shape is not another person of God. It's not another spirit of God that's not the Father. It's just God, the spirit of God made visible, okay? Now, Jesus is not just the spirit of God made visible. We also also have to deal with that. So we can use that logic to explain the spirit descending in a bodily shape like a dove, okay? Jesus, however, is not just the spirit made visible. That's something like Teclamarium doctrine, which we don't teach in Pentecost. We don't believe in divine flesh. We don't think that Jesus was just a figure of a man who was actually a spirit walking the earth. We believe he is fully man and fully God. And just like we have to speak in a committed way of his, div- of his divinity because he is God manifested in the flesh, we have to say that. He is God, but we also have to speak with equal conviction about his humanity, okay? And who, who he is and what he does as a man is what redeems you and I. So Romans chapter number five and verse 18. I talked about this last week, but here, here's the question again. Why is he always called the son of God and never called God the son? Why is, why, why, why are there never, why is there never a conversation in heaven in the New Testament between the three persons in the book of Revelation, okay? It's always God, and then you have the Son of God who does the will of God the Father, okay? This is why. Romans chapter number five, verse 18 says, therefore is by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Who are we talking about? Adam. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. Who are we talking about there? Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Listen, obedience defies the doctrine of co-equality. The obedience of Christ completely upends the doctrine of co-equality in the Trinity. He is submitted. He is constantly submitted throughout the New Testament. Over and over we see him. He says, I I came not to do my will, but him that sent me, okay? The submission of Jesus Christ is there to reveal his humanity in a truly authentic human way. He's not pretending to be a man. He is a man. He's fully man and fully God. And no man who is not submitted to God could ever do the will of God. Do you understand that Jesus, if he was not submitted to God, then he would be no better than the first Adam. The first Adam messed this whole thing up by disobedience. So it makes sense that Jesus had to obey, right? Revelation chapter number five and verse number one, John is describing what he sees in the heavens. And I I read this last week as well. It says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written uh, within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? What book are we talking about here, do you think? Yeah, somebody said it, the Lamb's Book of Life, the book that you and I's names are supposed to be written in, right? Verse number three says, and no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. How many are thankful that he came to loose the book that we couldn't loose? You understand that it's the work that he did, not as God, but as man, that granted him access to that book. God wrote these rules. And when man messed it up, God decided I'll play by my own rules. I heard one teacher say it like this time. He said, I'll I'll tie one hand behind my back if I have to, and I'll become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I I I will come as a man submitted in a way that I didn't have to be and die for sins that I didn't commit to free them from their sins, okay? So... In light of all of that, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse 42, Paul, remember, we had just explained through Romans 5. Paul had just got done explaining in Romans 5 that it was because of one man's disobedience this whole thing got messed up, and it's by the obedience of one that it all gets fixed, okay? 1 Corinthians 15 and 42 says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is 
a spiritual body, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord. The second man is the Lord. And that is all you can really ever understand about the oneness of God and the incarnation of Christ. That it was not a man making himself like God, but it was God making himself a man to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. So when we speak of his humanity, go, let's go back to the baptism of Jesus now. Jesus in Luke chapter number three and verse number 21 Jesus, the man, is God touching earth. This is God and earth coming together in the form of a servant. And in Luke 3 and 21, the Bible says, Now when all the people were baptized, excuse me, now when all the, pe- when, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized, praying, the heavens was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Verse 38, uh, or excuse me, Luke chapter number three and verse 38, I read this to you last week. So Jesus, so, the, so God speaks and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then at the very end of the chapter, Luke goes on this long genealogy of Christ and reminds us of the first Adam who was also the son of God in whom he was not pleased. Disclosing the sonship of Jesus Christ is about understanding his humanity, not a second person in the divinity. When you speak of sonship, you're speaking of something especially human. So it's not wrong when you read those scriptures, you say, oh, the father said, this is my beloved son. Does that mean there's a trinity? No, that means there's God who's approving of the Messiah who came to do the work that had to be done. We're speaking of a man in this context. Now, of course, we'll get to that later. One of the other questions was explaining the dual nature of Christ. We speak often of his divinity and oneness, Pentecostalism, and we should. Okay, we know that he's the fullness of the Godhead, Bodily, we know he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. First Timothy three sixteen, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. We know he's divine. Nobody disagrees on that oneness or Trinity. We all believe that. The issue is we disagree about sonship, and we explain sonship through the humanity. We do not explain sonship through a divine second person. Okay, so I hope that answers the question about the baptism of Christ. Uh, number three, please explain the right hand of God as in Stephen's vision, etc. Okay. Acts chapter number seven and verse 54 is where this story begins about Stephen and his vision after his stoning. Scripture said that Stephen gets done preaching and there's a principle here. This is obviously not uh, in my notes, but there's a principle here you got to understand. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached, I had a professor one time ask the question, what did Peter preach on the day of Pentecost? And we're quick to say, repent, be baptized, every one of you. That's not exactly right. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and asked the question, what shall we do? So we can't get the cart in front of the horse and rushing people to water and rushing people to repentance who don't know who Jesus is. Amen? Okay. But there's a second, there's a second aspect here. It says, this is Stephen's experience in the exact same context. So Peter had this, situ- Peter had this whole, whole thing. They heard this and they were pricked in their hearts and they asked, what shall we do? When Stephen preached, they heard these things. They were also cut to the heart, but they gnashed on him with their teeth. So here's a principle. Not all the seed that you sow finds good ground. Some people reject the gospel. Stephen preaches his word. It says on, in verse number 55 that he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. It's so funny to me that everybody wants to know about the right hand. I want to know what does it mean when it says he saw the glory of God? Because the scriptures tell us no man has seen God at any time. God is a spirit. So what exactly, and here's a, here's a good question. Somebody, maybe somebody can answer this for me. Can you show me the right hand of an omnipresent God? Where does the left begin and the right end? That's not very easy to answer. The right hand of, what do you mean when you say the right hand of God? That's a little bit difficult to explain, isn't it? So here's the question. 
Are we speaking strictly literally here? Not really. There's a principle you've got to understand. These kind of two things go together. What I just explained about the humanity of Christ and what I'm getting ready to talk about. So it says that he being full of the Holy Ghost, he looks up, he sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and I see God the Son standing on the right hand of God. I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God because you've got to remember God is a spirit. He is the invisible. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You have God who is above all and through all and in you all, and Jesus is God revealed, okay? He says that I see the son of man for a reason. That connects to the right hand, and we'll get there in just a second. Notice that Stephen did not say that I see the heavens open and God the son standing right next to God the father. That is not what he saw. He said he saw the son of man on the right hand of God. First principles, we already said it, but I'll repeat. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. John 1, 18 says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. This is why Jesus could say, no man cometh to the father but by me. If you don't know me, you don't know him because I'm in the father and the father in me. And if you're a Trinitarian, you can agree with the father in me part, but that I'm in the father thing, that's a little bit hard to explain. Jesus said, I'm in the father. And the Father's in me. He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest then, show us the Father. Jesus is the only Father you're ever going to see with your natural eye. Jesus is God revealed in the earth, okay? So God is the Spirit. And in order to describe his characteristics throughout all of the Bible, we use anthropomorphism all the time. And we do it without even thinking about it. We do it when we're reading the Bible, we gloss right over it. But we give visual, we, we, we're giving visual animated definable qualities to an otherwise invisible God, okay? So for example, Exodus chapter number 15 and verse six, same principle that we just saw with, Steve, or with Stephen Stoning. The right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Who was standing at the right hand again? And What did he just say in the book of Exodus about what that right hand does? Dashes the pieces and enemies. I like that. Psalm 16 and 8, David said, I have set the Lord always before me. Here it is. Because he is at my right hand. So hold on. First you have Jesus at his right hand, and now he's at my right hand. What is this about? Okay, we're Old Testament still, right? So he's saying God is at my right hand. How can the omnipresent God be at my right hand if he's in the heavens? And this is, the, this is what confounds me. I mentioned it last week. Our, our, our good brother, uh, John MacArthur, uh, was teaching a lesson recently about uh, the errors of oneness or whatever. And he, he mentioned this. He said, you know, from a oneness perspective, it's like the baptism of Jesus would be God can't be all three at the same time. So you've got the father who has to do this and then the son, uh, he has to go here and do this as the son and he has to go do this as the, as, the, as the spirit. And I laugh because that's exactly what the doctrine of the Trinity teaches is that because he can't be all in all, he has to be three. We don't believe that. We believe that God is omnipresent. We believe that in as much as he fills the heavens, he fills the earth, okay? He's living on the inside of me and he's also working in you. All right, that's how an omnipresent spirit works. And so what is it? We'll we'll keep reading. Here's another one. Psalm uh, 17 and seven. This is a big one. Psalm 17, seven and eight. It says, show me thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand. Can I tell you, he is still saving by his right hand. Okay, the right hand of God is the saving arm of God. This is why Jesus is standing at the right hand. Whatever Stephen saw that day, Jesus on the right hand is no accident. This is God revealing to Stephen the manner by which he works in the earth, okay? To say that my right hand is at work somewhere isn't to say that that's another person that's not me. It's the manner by which I act on something, okay? This is the saving arm of God in the earth is Jesus Christ. Keep reading, though. Them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against thee. Verse number eight, keep me as the apple of thy, hide me under the shadow of thy, does God have literal eyes? The Bible says the eye of the Lord is on them that love him. What do we mean by that? Does God have literal, what about wings? Does God have wings? He does in some of your dreams, I'm sure. But he don't have wings. As far as I know, God's a spirit. 
And yet we're talking about God with a right hand and God with eyes and God with wings. These are human expressions. These are the only way that the human mind can understand in principle. This is exactly why John saw the things that he saw in the book of Revelation. When you get to heaven, do you believe do you believe that Jesus, when you, when, you get, when you get to heaven and you see him face to face, he's going to be a lamb who is slain, but he's also walking, and he has seven eyes, and he's got seven horns, and he's, he's bleeding? Do you think that you're actually going to see that? Or is it supposed to be describing something? It's supposed to be teaching you a principle, okay? This is why the writer was so careful to say, uh, when he's speaking uh, of what Stephen saw, he said that he sees him at the right hand of the glory of God, because God is a spirit. And Jesus is that spirit revealed in the earth, which is, by the way, why they were so offended after he proclaimed it while they're stoning him and immediately after that, that they kill him because they knew exactly what he was saying, that the one he had just preached to them about and they rejected was none other than the God of Israel. It was the God of Israel revealed and they dismissed him. They rejected him. So when we read uh, what Stephen saw, the same way we read uh, the book of Psalms, the whole picture does become more clear. God cannot be seen by the eye of man, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's Colossians 1 and 15. And so we might ask the question, why did he see him at the right hand of the glory of God? Why the right hand? Why not someplace else? Why not see Jesus only? And you have to understand that in as much as I can, the only way that I can say it to you is to say that Jesus is the right hand of God. He is the power of God. He is the power of God unto salvation. That is what the work of Jesus Christ in the earth is. It's his arm at work. Jesus is the redeeming arm of God. He's the power in the earth. This does not mean that there are two on the throne or that there are two thrones in heaven. And we know that that's true because Revelation chapter number four and verse two tells us when John sees in the book of Revelation, the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he says, I saw, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and a throne and one sat on. A throne and one sat on the throne. That's all that you, can un- that's all that you need to know about who Jesus really is. The voice that proclaimed, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, is the same voice that proclaimed from behind John, I'm the one who was dead and is risen and is alive forevermore. One voice. I hope that that uh, answers that question. I'm going to try and move on here. I'm running out of time. Um, number five, this was, uh, this was a, an interesting question, I thought, uh, topically. Uh, it's come up a few times uh, over the last couple of years. This question said, if we know that the angel didn't actually tell Mary to name Jesus, Jesus, but Yeshua, and the apostolic faith hinges everything on the power being in his name, why do we as a church not use his actual name, Yeshua? Okay. First of all, I will say this. I do believe that all of your faith does hinge on that name. Okay. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That being said, names are not just sounds we pronounce. Names have record and fame of our existence attached to them, okay? Words are sounds with meaning, okay? Names carry your record, your fame, and your identity, okay? And so I want you to, I'm gonna, if I can, help you understand this without getting too drawn into it. John chapter number 19 and verse 19 Again, one of those passages we kind of read through quick, but it really does answer this question pretty succinctly. We've got to get out of our head that Jesus lived, and be careful how I say this because anybody who knows me knows what I mean. We've got to get out of the idea that Jesus lived in a primarily Jewish Israel in the first century. He did not. Jerusalem was very Jewish. The rest of the land, not so much. Hebrew was a dead language by the first century. Nobody is speaking the Hebrew that you read in the Old Testament by the first century. Aramaic was kind of like a Hebrew kind of proto-Semitic hybrid. But most people are speaking Greek or Latin. And that does matter because in John 19 and 19, the Bible says that Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. 
Then said the chief priests of Jews to the Pilate, or to Pilate, uh, write not the king of the Jews, but he, that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Again, names are not just sounds we pronounce. Names carry record and fame. The name of Jesus was not just for the Jews only, but for the whole world. This is John 3.16, fundamental Christian stuff right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's my question. When he wrote, this is Jesus, king of the Jews, above the head of the cross, were those three different names in Greek and Hebrew and Latin? Were they talking about three different people? No. They're all talking about one and the same person. The only difference is how you pronounce it, okay? So his name was pronounced Yeshua to those who knew him best, yes. But to those, even the Jews, hear me, even the Jews who gathered on the day of Pentecost to hear the preaching of Peter came out of every tribe and tongue in the known world, and they would frame to pronounce it differently. In fact, when Paul traveled the world, it's unlikely in many cases, it's probably impossible that he spoke Hebrew to the people that he ministered to. Rather, he spoke and wrote in Greek. Your New Testament is written in Greek. Greek record, uh, the Greek records the name of Jesus as it would be rendered in the Greek, Aesis. And Pilate wrote his name in the three dominant languages of the empire so that all could see, not just the Jews, who this Jesus really was. If you spoke Latin, you see the king of the Jews. If you spoke Greek, the king of the Jews. If you spoke Hebrew, the king of the Jews. The Latin-speaking people needed to know who Jesus was. The Greek-speaking people needed to know who Jesus was, and the Jews certainly needed to as well. The revelation of who Jesus is does not come through the pronunciation of the Hebrew name Yeshua. There was, if that was the case, just follow the logic with me. If, it, if that was the case, if it's, if it's the pronunciation that was essential, then by necessity... That would mean that everybody from the first century to now, essentially, was lost. There's entire nations of people who adopted this doctrine that did not speak, read, or write Hebrew, ever. They didn't take Hebrew classes. When, when by the time Paul travels to Athens, and he's in Rome, and he's, and he's uh, teaching in the school of Tyrannus, many of the synagogues by this time, not all, but many of the synagogues, are rejecting the doctrine, and so the doctrine spreads to the Gentiles, Gentile nations that do not speak Hebrew, okay? This is why Paul was so effective as an evangelist to the Gentiles, because he was a Greek speaker. And you also have to understand that Jesus, the Christ, was not the only Jesus in the New Testament. So again, let's go back to the question. If all that matters is the phonetic pronunciation, why can't I be named, uh, why can't I be baptized in the name of, 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 of Jesus Barabbas? You know, why, why, why can't I be named uh, and, and baptized in the name of Jesus of, of Simon, right? As long as I say Jesus, does it really matter? Or are we talking about a particular Jesus? Oh, and then all of a sudden, the record and the fame of his identity becomes more important than how you pronounce it. Okay, so you have to understand that when I say Jesus, whether I'm saying in English, Jesus, if I'm saying in Greek, Aesis, if I'm saying Jesus, if I'm saying it in German, Jesus, Chinese, they say Yesu Chidu. Hebrew, Yeshua, these are not different names. These are one name that I pronounce different ways. And when we say name, when we say, if I go up to somebody who speaks a different language than me and I say, my name is Stephen, and they respond by saying, good to meet you, however they say, Stefan or something, they pronounce it differently. They're not talking about a different person. <laughs> They're talking about me, the person that they've just met, that they've seen with their own two eyes. And they know my identity by who I am, not just by how they pronounce my name, okay? No matter how you frame to pronounce it, the same record and fame, the same identity, the same disclosure is wrapped up in that name. No matter what language you say it in or how you pronounce it, his name is still Jesus. God is my salvation. And that doesn't change no matter what language you're speaking. The name means what it means no matter what language you speak. These are not different names. These are different phonetic framings of the same name. I can promise you, I, would, I don't have a lot of money, but I would, I would give you every dollar that I have if I was wrong, that not everybody who was baptized in the New Testament was baptized with somebody pronouncing Yeshua over them. They were often probably baptized with somebody saying, in the name of Aesis, or in the name of whatever language. Think about, go back to the book of Acts for me, and think about it in Acts chapter number two. 
all these, remember, these are not Gentiles yet. These are Jews that have gathered from every part of the world who speak different languages. And they get up and Peter gets up and he preaches on the day of Pentecost. Now, the Bible says that they heard them speak with other tongues and they were confounded. They said, we hear them speak in our own language. But when Peter stands up to preach, he's preaching in a definite language for sure. He's, he's speaking something. And it may not be a language that everybody in there recognizes. That means there was probably translators there. The Bible says, it goes, go back and read Acts chapter number two, all the different nations that are represented that day. And the truth of the matter is, is that no matter how they heard it, whether it was from the voice of a translator or they understood what Peter was saying or it came from somebody else, they knew who he was talking about. It was the record and the fame of the man that had been hanging on that cross. It was the, it was the identity of that man who had been raised from the dead. Now, that doesn't mean that, of course, um, that you can substitute the name of Jesus for any old thing that you want because, again, he does have a name. How you pronounce the name is not critical, at least not from a scriptural perspective. That you use the name is important. How you pronounce the name is not. So I hope that that answers that question to whoever may have asked it. Um, and then I, I, don't, I won't have time for all the rest of them, but explaining what is meant by the dual nature of Christ seems like a good uh, place to wrap up. In fact, we can actually put the last two together. Uh, explaining what is meant by the dual nature, and then the last question was give an example uh, or give an explanation of John chapter number one, verses one through 14. So throw John chapter one and verse one up there and we'll just, we'll work through it. You want an explanation of the dual nature? Here you go. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse number two, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse three, you can just keep going. All things were made by him. Somebody say all means all. And without him was not anything made that was made. Verse number four. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same, come, uh, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, not made by them. And the world, received, the world knew him not. Keep going. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The word has a name which were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then the last verse, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten God, the son. You have got to get this in your heart, that Jesus came to reveal one God to the world. He is not a second person of God revealing the first person of God and also himself at the same time. When we speak of Jesus as the word of God, the word of God made flesh, first of all, I would just say, let's just speak practically. My words are always with me. When I speak, are my words someone different from me or are my words an expression of me? My words are a way that you can know me. My words are the way that I'm revealed to you. My words are my words. It's me revealed. It's me made known. It's me making known. When I speak, that's what words are. The world was made by words. Your world, by the way, is made by words. We can talk about that maybe some other time, but your words have power. And so to speak of Jesus as the word of God, yes, he is the incarnate of the law of Moses. I believe that. He's, he's the incarnate of the prophets. We see that on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he is also the expression of God in the earth, not the expression of God the Son in the earth. You have to keep these two things in your head at the same time. That you have God and God revealed. That does not mean God and then the other person of God. It's one God. So this is why the writer could say, which sounds paradoxical to us, in the beginning was the word, and the word was both with God and was God, and that that word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. The reason why the writer went on this long tangent explaining that he was the light and that John that came was not that light, but he came to bear witness of that light 
And then he takes it another step further and he says, by the way, that light, he, the worlds were made by him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Somebody answer this question for me. How else could an invisible God come to the people that he created if not to do it as a man? Are we speaking of two different people of God or are we talking about the infinite, the, the impassable God, the God who is outside of time, stepping into time, the, the God that is beyond our knowledge, making himself known This is what we're talking about when we say that the word was God and that word was made flesh. It's the word from the beginning, the one who created all things, came unto his own. This is not just speaking of the Jews. Came unto his own is talking about the world. He came unto you and I and we received him not. He was despised and rejected of men. It is the God of all creation who has revealed himself to us in a temporal, visible, knowable aspect, in a way that human beings could comprehend. Brother uh, Jeremy Lang has has pointed out to me, and I'm closing with this. um, Brother Lang has pointed out to me before uh, the scripture that we read, and he, he says, the very first messianic prophecy, the very first word of the Messiah that you'll ever find in the scriptures is actually in Genesis chapter number one and verse one. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, he talks about there's these, there's these two letters that go together that don't have a direct translation in the Hebrew, but it's the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph and the Tab. It says, in the beginning, he said, the best way you could describe it, if you were to read it literally, is to say, in the beginning, the God who created the heavens and the earth, it says that, that, that word, God created the heavens and the earth, that phrase, he said, it would be like if you were drawing an arrow from the heavens to the earth and the earth to the heavens and saying almost as if, In the beginning, what was not knowable was made knowable, or in the beginning, heaven touched earth. And that's exactly what Jesus is, is heaven touching earth. It's it's making known what you could not possibly know, what you could not possibly understand as a human with your natural understanding, with your natural eye. That's why he came as a man. It was, uh, I was, uh, I brought this book with me. This is a, a copy, not to do a plug, but this is a copy of my latest book. And I'm not going to read my words, uh, but I am going to read a quote from it um, uh, from one of the uh, foremost Trinitarian thinkers of the second century who was arguing with a man who believed adamantly uh, in water baptism in Jesus' name only. If you read some of his responses uh, to the, the gentleman that I'm reading, if you read his responses, they sound remarkably like responses we would use today. Uh, he quotes... Um, Jesus saying, he that has seen me has seen the Father. How say his sin show us the Father. He quotes many scriptures about Jesus' name, baptism. He's very familiar with the, the word. And this is what this Trinitarian thinker threw out there. He said, quote, but this doctrine of yours bears a likeness to the Jewish faith of which this is the substance. So to believe in one God as to refuse to reckon the son besides him and after the son, the spirit. Now, what difference would there be between us and them if there were not this distinction which you are breaking down? What need would there be of the gospel if thenceforth the Father and the Son and the Spirit are not both believed in as three and as making one God? I thought the argument was interesting because the truth of the matter is, is that what makes Oneness Pentecostals unique in all of Christianity is that we are, in large part, with I'm sure some small exceptions, but we are the group, not a group, but we are the group of Christians all over the world who do not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity and also uphold the divinity of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's exactly what the Jews of the first century believed. The reason why this writer could say what you're describing sounds a lot like the Jewish faith, well, good enough, because all the disciples were Jews and Jesus is a Jew. And all the first Christians are Jews until Cornelius. That makes sense to me. That tells me that I'm on the right track that I'm paying attention to what's been written in those scriptures, that we don't, uh, we don't pray to three persons of God. I don't know if I shared this story, but in closing, if you stand with me. I don't know if I shared this story last week or not, but I'll share it again. I was uh, uh, in my second or third year at Indiana Wesleyan, and there was a woman in that class that uh, she spoke up. She was talking to the professor, and she said, um, I've been struggling a little bit lately uh, in understanding the right methods and manner of prayer. And she said, and I don't necessarily know who I'm supposed to address for what in prayer. When, do I, when is it appropriate to pray to God the Father and when is it appropriate to address his son? 
And my heart really did break because I realized how blessed we are in Pentecost. We understand that when you say Jesus, you get absolutely everything that you need. When we say neither is there salvation any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so I took her to Romans chapter number eight and verse nine. We went through the breakdown I did with you tonight of the spirit, understanding how many, how many spirits really are there. Are you praying to two different spirits or is it really just one God? And I don't know if she got it that night, to be honest. We talked for a little bit and it was kind of the end of that conversation. What I didn't know is that there was a, a young pastor and his wife that were in that class with me. They pastored an AME church in Indianapolis. It's African Methodist Episcopal. And uh, they had overheard me doing the Bible study with her. And uh, the man came over to me and he said, hey, he said, I've never, his name was Vincent. He said, I've never heard John chapter one, the way you described it like that before. He said, I, I pastor a church here in Indianapolis. He said, tell me more about what oneness is. He said, I've never heard of that. So we started to go through the scriptures together. And I, I told him everything pretty much that I've told you over the last three weeks. And and I could see the lights go on in his head a little bit. He said, man, he said, I got to know more about this. He said, uh, he said man, I want to come to your church. And so, uh, you know, he lived pretty far away. He's over two hours from my church. And so it wasn't really feasible. So instead we planned. I said, well, where do you live? And he said, well, he said, I, I, don't, he said, I don't know if you know where, where Fletcher Avenue is in Indianapolis. He said, but I, he said, I live right on Fletcher. And I said, well, I said, hey, I said, I know a church on Fletcher Avenue that we can go to. And so we did, we, uh, he and his wife and I. We packed up that Wednesday, and we, I was a little bit nervous that they were going to maybe back out. And uh, we went to, uh, to Calvary Tabernacle in Indy. Brother Mooney was still pastoring at the time. And I remember Brother Mooney got up there that night, and he preached, though the vision, Terry, wait for it. And uh, he got done preaching. We had the altar call, and my intention was to take them down and uh, introduce them to Brother Sleva and uh, get them connected a little bit with some, some people from the college. And as I'm walking down there, and I, I said hi to Brother Sleva and was talking for just a moment, I look over, and Vincent Amber had went just straight to the altar for altar call and had lifted their hands. And but before my conversation with Brother Sleva was over, uh, Vincent and his wife both were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, with evidence speaking in other tongues. Both were baptized. <laughs> to my understanding, he is still to this day preaching oneness in his AME church, which uh, is just it's phenomenal. And so what that experience taught me and what I really hope that you take from the last few weeks is that Although I, I greatly enjoy, I love talking about history and I love talking about theology and, and doctrines. I, I, I enjoy all of that, but you've got to understand that there is never anything in your life that's going to be as powerful as this word. And if you'll trust it to do the work, this word will do the work all on its own. You don't have to hide it. You don't have to shade it. You don't have to use some scriptures and hide other scriptures. You can read the whole word at face value and it all testifies of the same thing, that to wit God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Or do you believe that? Amen. Amen.